this chapter, we will be introducing and studying derivatives. In this lesson, we will be looking at the sum and difference rule. All right, hi everybody. We're going to continue on looking at our rules of derivatives. And in this lesson, we're going to look at a pretty straightforward one. In fact, this one is, is so straightforward uh, and, and fairly intuitive that most of you would probably do it correctly without even thinking about it. So we're going to take a look at the sum and difference rule. So this one says that if f and g are both differentiable, so all on their own, you can take the derivative of them, then so is the sum or the difference of them. And this is how the rule works. If you take the derivative of a sum or a difference of two functions, that is the same as the sum or the difference of the two derivatives. Okay. Now, I don't want you to think that, that this is like the derivative distributing to those things so much as is this that if you're adding functions together, you're basically taking the derivative of each, each function separately. And we can prove that. So let's let capital F of X be equal to F plus G of X. And so if we apply first principles, okay, we plug in that X plus H into capital F minus F of X. But because capital F is F plus G, then that's going to be F of X plus H plus G plus X plus H. Now that's all together, this right here, what I'm circling here, that's capital F. And then when we subtract capital F, that's going to be F of X together with G of X. Now what I've done here is just distributed this negative through both the terms uh, that comprise capital F. Now we can change the order in the numerator just by moving that f of x forward a little bit. That's why it ends up here. And then the h in the denominator actually can be distributed okay, to the two different pairs of terms there. And the limit of, uh, this is one of the rules of, the, of limits, and we looked at this earlier, the, the limit of the entire piece Okay, can be broken down into the sum of the limits of the, of the pieces there. And so then we end up with the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h plus the limit as h approaches 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x over h. And those pieces right there are just the derivatives of f and g separately. And so you can see that we can figure out, okay, we can figure out what uh, the overall derivative is just by taking the derivative of the pieces there. Okay, and so what we've done up here, we defined f to be the sum of those two, but you could very easily, like it says down here, you could very easily have adapted that to be the difference between those uh, the two of the functions there. Would have worked out exactly the same. Anyway, that being said, let's take a look at some examples here. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at just a couple of examples of the sum and difference rule. So find the derivatives of the following. So a is y equals 3x cubed plus 4x squared plus 5. Okay, so here we go. So here's a. So when we take the derivative here, now instead of applying first principles, I'm going to get lazy here, and we're just going to apply um, our, our power rule to these individual terms here. So 3x cubed, okay, Bring down the 3. Well, there's a 3 down there already. So 3 times 3 is 9x, and then I'll subtract 1 from the exponent. So 9x squared. For my next one, 4x squared. Again, because it's a separate term, I've just, just shown you that all we have to do is take the derivative of this term separately. So bring down the 2. Okay, 4 times 2 is going to be 8x. Take 1 off the exponent. We get 1. And then over here, we know that the derivative of a constant is 0. So the derivative is going to be 9x squared plus 8x. So quick and easy to do. Now, for b, okay, let's try, uh, in this case here, before we take the derivative, uh, we really should expand that out so we can see what those individual terms are. So that is going to be x minus 3 over root x. And I'm just going to do it like this. I'm going to take this extra step here just because I don't want people to get lost in the algebra here. So when I distribute that through, x times x is going to be x squared. Then I'm going to get uh, x times negative 3 uh, over root x. So it's going to be negative 3x over root x. Uh, and then because it's squared, it's going to be the same thing, 3x over root x. And this is going to be plus 9 over x when I multiply those, those two together. This is going to become x squared 
minus. Now I'm gonna because I got common denominators here. I'm gonna add the numerators. That's gonna get me six. But then I'm gonna have x over root x. That's like x to the one over x to the one half. And when I subtract, I'm going to get x to the one half up in the numerator. Plus. And now because I know that I'm going to be taking the derivative in a second here, I'm going to bring that x up and make that 9x to the negative 1. So that now when I take the derivative of this, it's, it's a, a very straightforward process here. The derivative of x squared will be 2x. The derivative of negative 6x to the 1 half, and again, I just take the derivative of the term all by itself. Bring the 1 half down. We're going to multiply that. Remember, we're going to multiply this by the coefficient out front. So negative 6 times a half will be negative 3. Uh, x to the, we subtract 1 off there, so it'll be negative 1 half. And then I'm going to take that negative 1 down from that last term there as the exponent, multiply it by the coefficient. Okay, so that negative 1 is going to get multiplied by the 9. That'll give me negative 9, x, and then I subtract 1 off the exponent there, so it's going to be to the negative 2. And so we might write this now, I mean, that might be enough. Sorry, before I write anything more here, that could be all you need to do. Kind of depends on who your teacher is, to be honest with you. But you might have to bring that down right with positive exponents, in which case this is like minus 3 over root x, and this will be minus 9 over x squared, and that works as well. Okay, so just a couple of examples doing that uh, turn by turn. So now let's take a look at a, a kind of an application question, if, if you will. So at what points does this curve right here, y equals x cubed plus 3x squared minus 24x plus 1. At what points does it have a horizontal tangent line? Okay, so to have a horizontal tangent line, let's think about what that means. Okay, horizontal tangent line, the slope is 0. So what that, what that means to us is we're going to take the derivative of this. And we're going to set that equal to 0. Because remember, the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. Okay, um, or the slope of the line tangent to the curve at a given point. Well, now this is actually substantially easier than it would have been uh, even just a, a little while ago because a, a cubic like that, if you're using first principles, that's not impossible, but it is going to be long. So here, we can now just really, really quickly take the derivative term by term. So the derivative of x cubed, we know will be 3x squared. The derivative of 3x squared will bring down the 2 and that will become 6 because there's a 3 out front, x. And then we've got negative 24x to the 1, so we'll bring down the 1, multiply, and then we get x to the 0. And then the derivative of the constant 1 is just going to be 0. So there's our derivative. That became a very quick, easy thing for us to do. Now we're going to have to do some algebra because now what we're going to do is we're going to replace our derivative there, y primed, with 0 because we know that if we're looking at a horizontal tangent line, the slope must be 0. And a derivative is going to be the slope. Now our work starts. And actually, that's going to be pretty characteristic of most calculus problems um, that we're going to encounter in this course. The calculus step is actually the, the easy, straightforward part. It's the algebra that comes afterwards. It's going to take you a bit of work here. Now here, when I take a look at this quadratic, I'm pretty lazy. I notice that everything there is divisible by 3. So I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by 3. That works out pretty easily. And then I will factor. What are we, what's that going to be? x plus 4, x minus 2. So I get two solutions here, negative 4, positive 2. Okay. So now, those the two points where that occurs, okay, are going to be negative 4, comma. Okay, now i got to go up here to my, to my original function right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to plug that negative 4 in. So negative 4 cubed, okay, is going to be negative 64. And then we've got here plus 3 times negative 4 squared. Well, negative 4 squared is going to be positive 16. So plus 3 times 16, and that's going to be 48. Uh, minus 24 times negative 4. That's going to be kind of big and awkward. But plus 1. And when we put that all together we're going to get negative 4 comma 81. Now, if we plug positive 2 into that, 2 cubed is 8. Okay, I should say or. Okay, 2 cubed is 8. Uh, 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12. So it's going to be 8 plus 12. Minus 24 times 2. Well, that's going to be minus 48 plus 1. 
And when we do that, we get negative 27. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means on our graph right here, see, we already know, we already know that this curve up here is a cubic. It's a positive cubic. So I know it's going to be moving upward, okay? Now, I could spend a little bit of time factoring this. And actually, that's exactly what, sorry, that's exactly what you would have done in, a, in a, a different course. You're probably a course prior to this. You would have looked at this and you would have found the spots where this thing crosses the x-axis. And that's wonderful. Now what we're interested in, though, is, is how it behaves away from the x-axis. And we've got this point now, negative 481, somewhere up here. Whoops. Sorry, I don't, that is not what I meant to do here. But anyway, well, I, actually that works. And then I've got the point here, 2, negative 27, that's going to be down here. Those two points right there are going to be the points where the graph has a horizontal tangent line, meaning that the graph's horizontal uh, tangent looks like that. And so now, if I go back to this, uh, actually, go back to the, I'll go back to this one right here. This is going to look like this. And that is roughly what it's going to look like. It's a cubic. Okay, I know, I know that from the original. But now I know that it's got these horizontal tangent lines at negative 481 and positive 2, negative 27. So the neat thing about calculus here is it allows me to in investigate the behavior of the graph away from the x-axis, whereas prior to this, I would have spent most of my time looking at how it's behaving or, or how it's crossing the x-axis. Really cool.